Thank you for coming to Concordia University's Celebrating Indigenous Expertise and Sustainability Conference. My name is Zoe Davis. I'm a Bachelor's of Science Ecology student, and I will be discussing ecolinguistics. I would first like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Ganangahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters in which we gather today. Jojoge, or Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future and our ongoing relationships with the indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. Language and the environment are intimately connected. The words we use influences our environment and vice versa. Ecolinguistics studies this connection in depth. The field of ecolinguistics is loosely grouped into four separate subcategories. Symbolic ecology studies the coexistence of languages in a specific area. Natural ecology studies the relation between the biological environment and language. Sociocultural ecology observes the impact of sociological factors on language concerning the environment. And cognitive ecology studies how the individual perceptions of environment are impacted by language. These subcategories are not to divide the field, but rather create a more unified and holistic understanding of it. What ecolinguists tend to agree on is that Western language is incredibly anthropocentric, meaning that speakers of this language tend to place humans in their primary frame of reference or master frame. We can see examples of this in such words as dirt, implying that soil is unhygienic and bad, badlands and wastelands referring to uncolonized, untouched lands, and even in the Old Testament of the Bible with such verses as, and God said, let make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish and over the fowl and over the cattle and over all the earth. This naturally breeds a disconnect between speakers of language and the environment and makes it much easier to mindlessly consume resources. Many issues in ecolinguistics stem from the very naming of concepts in the natural world. In Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, she states, You would think that biologists of all people would have words for life, but in Western scientific language, terminology is used to define the boundaries of our knowing. What lies beyond our grasp remains unnamed. Robin Wall Kimmerer is a professor of plant ecology and environmental biology of the State University of New York and is a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. This is an excerpt from her essay, Learning the Language of Animacy, where she details the joys and the struggles of learning her Potawatomi language as an adult, in which there are only nine speakers worldwide. She notes that Potawatomi is very much a verb-based language. In English, only 30% of the words are verbs, whereas in Potawatomi, it is 70%. Everything is animate. All these verbs and conjugations do make the language incredibly complex and difficult to learn, but it assigns much more agency to the natural world. She says, when a bay is a noun, it is defined by humans, trapped between its shores and contained by the word. But the verb, wikwigama, to be a bay, releases the water from bondage and lets it live. This word encompasses all the facets that are involved in being a bay, how it interacts with the environment, how it interacts with the fellow creatures, the rocks, the people, whereas bay is just bay and it dies with that word. Wikiwagama is more present. It is being, rather than it is or it was. All in all, Robin Wall Kimmerer explains that English doesn't give us enough tools for communicating that we respect the world around us. An example of this lack of respect is found in traditional Linnaean taxonomy. Linnaean taxonomy is the organization system that is widely used today and was pioneered by a Swedish botanist in the 1700s and is based purely on morphology. Linnaeus famously said, there shall be order, which implies that he sought to organize and rank in a sort of hierarchy rather than to understand. Linnaeus organized beings into kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Domain came before kingdom and was added in the 1990s, and genus and species were often shortened to be the binomial name for the being. For example, Tradescantia zebrina, as pictured. The genus named Tradescantia is named for John Tradescant the Elder and John Tradescant the Younger, British colonialists and explorers, and zebrina comes from the Basque word for zebra. This name doesn't tell us anything about the plant in particular tells us about explorers at the time and that it is striped like a zebra, but tells us nothing about the environment, how it grows, how it is used, etc. Even if the Latin binomial name tells us nothing specific about the organism, academics still prefer this name to folk taxonomies. Even when most of the time the organisms in question already had indigenous names before colonialists renamed them. Sometimes academics try to hybridize indigenous language and culture into the names of their species, but most of the time this is counterintuitive and downright incorrect. 
This is often found in species in Australia and New Zealand when academics try to incorporate Maori words into the species names. A few examples of these are the Pelea Sandwikensis, which is named for Pele, the Maori volcano god who is incredibly sacred and they did not get permission to use, and the Earl of Sandwich, who is a 1700s colonialist. Another one is the Kopua Nuimata, which uh, incorporates Nuimata, which is supposedly Maori for big eyes, but it actually directly translates to eye big. And also the Pelagea Kakatahi, which is named for the Kakatahi village, which is 1.5 kilometers south of where the dig site was. But Kakatahi translates to one parrot, and this is an isopod. The names of species should carry much more information than just morphological appearance and random colonizers. Names evoke memories of the past, and they provide a frame of reference to signify the connection of people, culture, and language to the environment, to historical, social, and political events. A fantastic example of this is Inuit folk taxonomy for marine animals. The categories include Umaguit, which encompasses all animals, Imarmiutit, which is from the root word imig, which is water, which means those that belong to the water and is marine mammals, Tininimiutit, which is from the root word tininik, which is intertidal zone, which is those that are from the shore, Ergamiutit, from erga, which is bottom of the water, so those that belong in the bottom of the ocean, Tariumiotiot, which is tariog, which is salt, and hence those that belong in salt water. Akaluit, which is fish. Puiji, which is for any animal that takes its head out of the water, specifically pinnipeds, so seals and sea lions. And finally, Timiat, which is from Timmy, for those who are situated higher than, hence those that fly, so birds and flying animals. These groupings not only carry significant information about the habitats of these animals, but also specific information that is crucial for hunting practices, especially in northern Canada where food sovereignty is at risk. Even though indigenous taxonomies are incredibly complex and incredibly useful, they're still not taken seriously in Western and citizen science. So how can we fix this and how can we implement Earth-centered language? Ecolinguist Cynthia Rosenfeld has three postulates for implementing Earth-centered language in everyday life. The first one is to be honest and transparent. When discussing issues pertaining to the earth and indigenous taxonomy and culture, it is important to take a step back and be mindful of the words you're picking because they have a lot of value. Going back to my previous example, when you're saying things such as wasteland or badland, take a moment to think. It's a wasteland for who? It is badland for who? Is it bad just because it's uncolonized? Natural spaces are not inherently wasteful. Her second postulate is to be kind, which is often easier said than done, but it is important to be kind to the earth and be kind to those who are there to protect it. It's important to put aside academic biases when discussing ecology. Her final postulate is to be creative. There are so many ways to implement earth-centered language and to listen to indigenous cultures. It is up to the individual to do the research and educate themselves on these methods. Something that is vital for implementing Earth-centered language and helping mitigate the biocultural diversity crisis is finding synergy between traditional ecological knowledge and citizen science. Traditional ecological knowledge, or TEK, is defined as knowledge, practice, and belief evolving by adaptive processes and handed down through generations by cultural transmission about the relationship of living beings, including humans, with one another and with the environment. This is where indigenous folk taxonomies and conservation efforts stem from. Citizen science, on the other hand, is the act of involving lay people with data acquisition and analysis in ecology. TEK and CS are two things that can and should coexist, but there are currently many barriers preventing this. On the one hand, citizen science is, for bigoted reasons, taken much more seriously and is therefore much more powerful than traditional ecological knowledge. Also, on occasion, citizen science can go too far when people are not being mindful of indigenous sacred practices and territories. Sometimes, much like Western science, citizen science can interfere with indigenous cultures and practice, which is detrimental to both fields of knowledge. However, both fields can and should work together and have proven to be incredibly powerful and helpful when they have. An example of this was cited in a case study involving the Concac, or Seri people of the Gulf of California and Mexico. A multidisciplinary team of academics combined citizen scientific efforts and traditional ecological knowledge to create an all-taxa biodiversity inventory in comparing ethnotaxa and western taxa. These two methods of data acquisition provided academics with detailed descriptions of the environment, which helped them identify new species, all while preventing language loss and helping to mitigate the biocultural diversity crisis. 
All in all, the language we use when addressing the environment has incredible power, and it is incredibly important to pay attention to indigenous practices when doing this. Thank you so much for listening. I've included some additional resources of podcasts and books related to subjects discussed in this presentation, as well as all of the journals that were referenced. You can forward any questions to me by my email at zoeandavis at gmail.com.